Hello guys. So the next three uh, mini lessons in biometry are addressing a topic that um, is sort of central to uh, much of what we're going to talk about for the rest of the semester. Um, <clears throat> well, not quite the rest of the semester, but a big chunk of our time is going to be uh, spent on analysis of variance. And um, I want to start off our analysis of variance discussion um, by uh, talking about models. And um, I know, you know some of you, when you hear the word models, you think of something like runway models like that. Um, but we aren't talking about that kind of model. We're talking about a mathematical model. And statistical models are particularly enigmatic for people, I think, because um, they ask you to think about things a little bit differently than you're used to. So, you know, we've already introduced the idea that many of our statistics um, have this notion of y as a function of x, our independent variables are determining something about our dependent variables, and we're asking whether the null model can be rejected. Okay, so we've already kind of come up with this kind of model. The kind of model I want to talk about now is a model of uh, what controls these dependent variables. And it's a way of um, breaking down uh, the quantitative value we get for a particular observation. So when we make an observation, whether it's you know photosynthetic rate on a leaf or height of an individual or speed of that individual or uh, um, amount of gene expression uh, or some kind of uh, concentration of a chemical in their, in their blood, uh, any kind of quantitative trait we can measure, um, we can call y, it's a y as you know, and uh, actually let's call this, let's call this y sub j. <laughs> um, Cause I'm gonna, I'm gonna use multiple subscripts here. Okay. Um, so, what is this particular value due to? Well, if we look at the sample, um, you know, we get an estimate of the mean of that, and and we realize that actually, to some degree, um, that particular observation is controlled or determined by the biology of the parametric population that it comes from. Not really by the population, but by just the trait of being a particular organism, right? So um, part of that is going to be um, uh, determined by the parametric mean. So mu is our parametric mean. And it kind of sets, if you want to think of it this way, it sets a an expectation uh, for um, this particular observation. And if we know nothing else about that individual, um, except that it, it is not going to be exactly at the mean most of the time, right? Because it will have some unexplained uh, variation away from the mean, some, if, some deviation, then we could add for that individual um, uh, this epsilon. So this is epsilon, and you can kind of think of this as error, um, which is why it's an E. And then it's think of this as unexplained deviation of that observation from the parametric mean. Okay, so that's one model, and it's not a very interesting one because basically it's saying that um, we don't have any explanation for any of this deviation of this observation from the parametric mean. It's all unexplained at this point. So let me give an example of this. Um, so let's say we're talking about, I really think it helps to make this concrete. Let's say we're talking about human height, okay? and individual J in the population, uh, you know, the J might stand for uh, 
Jenny, all right? <laughs> Jenny uh, has a, uh, a height of 160 centimeters. Okay. And um, what we are really saying with this model here is that um, that height is determined by the mean height, the parametric mean of human heights. Let's say that's 168. Okay, mu is 168 centimeters, um, plus a deviation of minus 8 centimeters due to unknown sources. So this is, this is Jenny's unexplained deviation okay, from the human mean height. All right, so um, that's one model. And we haven't explained anything about Jenny's deviation. We just say this is error, okay? And every individual deviates from the parametric mean, and some might be very close to it and so forth, but um, some will deviate more than others and so forth. And so we'll get some you know, distribution of human heights <laughs> and um, this variation around the parametric mean is error. Unless, of course, we start to recognize, hmm, you know, there are determining factors for this deviation. Okay, so we can modify our model um, by adding in variation. So we have mu as kind of our controlling overall height factor due to the fact that we're human. And then uh, we can add the effect of being, for example, um, male or female. So I might be male or I might be female. And that will alter the expectation for height for that individual plus epsilon, okay? So now we have some error above and beyond the effect um, of being female or male. Now Jenny happens to be female, right? So, so let's think about what this might look like for Jenny. So she's 160 centimeters in height and we know that the average human height is 168. Um, perhaps the effect of being female alpha f, right, so this Jenny is female, is, um, is minus 10 from the human parametric mean. So that's the average effect across all humans of being female. Um, and Jenny's error is actually plus 2. So this really changes our picture of Jenny's height, right? We, we now see Jenny as actually being taller than the average for humans. Um, and this 160 is comprised of these components. So what have we really done with this alpha, with this model where we've added in an effect of sex on height, right? So this is, this is our x <laughs> and this is our y. And we now have y as a function. We're saying sex determines something about y. What we're, doing, what we're saying is it has an additive effect of minus 10 of being female, okay? And, you know, if there are just two sexes, of course, the added effect of being males, assuming there are 50% males and females, would be plus 10, right? So, um, anyway, that's not normally the case. We would often have three or more groups um, in our groupings, in our alpha effects, but in this case, we have males and females, and so we have uh, symmetrical effects, presumably. So, the effect of being male would be plus 10 on average. Um, uh, and, and we still have unexplained error. So, um, so in this regard, you know, it looks like Jenny is actually above average for, for females, whereas in our previous model, um, we would have said she's below average without any explanation for why. Well, now we have a partial explanation for why she's below the human average. Um, it's because she's female. Okay, so um, this is... This is kind of interesting then to think generally about um, what is this model, um, what is it telling us? It says, um, 
what is or what does knowledge I like to think of it this way what does knowledge of the sex of the individual tell us about height about what height that individual might be um, is it significantly different from zero? Does the knowledge of the sex of the individual tell us greater than nothing about um, the height of the individual? In other words, does it have any predictive power uh, about the height of the individual, or is it not significant? And one of the ways to think about analysis of variance is it's telling us, um, it gives an indication gives us an answer to that question, uh, is alpha, or is the absolute value of alpha, because alpha can be negative, is al absolute value of alpha greater than zero? In other words, is there more than no effect <laughs> of no knowledge of the sex of the individual um, in terms of contributing to our understanding of this y variable height? And so if you start thinking about all statistical models in this kind of light, you can imagine that there are many kinds of models, right? We can make these models much more complex. This is a simple model where we've just added one variable sex, but we could have, you know, sex in here. We could have uh, ethnicity in here. We could have, um, oh, I don't know. Um, we could have parent height in here. So we could start including things about genetics. Uh, parent mean height, for example, would be a very logical one. Um, and so we could have lots of different alphas. And pretty soon, if we had a large enough sample size, we could test the significance of these different terms in terms of contributing to y. We can also start looking at uh, more complex things like does the effect of sex depend upon the ethnicity? In other words, is there a statistical interaction between these two? So we can add terms in our model which are more complex. We can even add nonlinear terms, for example, terms that are um, squared and cubed in order to look at curvilinearity. Okay, so I just wanted to point out that underlying all of this theory is um, this idea of factors contributing to um, the, ob the observed values that we see and we need to see through variation and ask whether we see effects above and beyond the error variation that naturally is going to be there. We have very little hope of ever explaining all of the variation among individuals in y sub i, but knowledge of certain things about those individuals will help us make predictions about what their height should be. Okay, and, and so if you think of the world <laughs> that way, you start, to, you start to realize how difficult it is to understand complex traits. I mean, take a trait like human intelligence, for example, what are all the factors that could go into determining human intelligence? It's going to be a huge list, right? So we're never going to completely understand it. There are going to be all kinds of interactions, uh, but we might explain a certain proportion of it, um, and that will be interesting. Um, I think ecologically or physiologically or in terms of molecular expression of genes, all of these explanations are part... Are, some of the most interesting things that we have to explain in all of biology. So, so I think if you kind of read more about these statistical models in Sokol and Rolf and how they're set up and how, how we think about them philosophically, you'll get a much better understanding of our ultimate goal, which is to use analyses of variance to test these models um, against the null the null hypotheses, okay, and perhaps reject those null hypotheses. All right, so, so construction of models using ANOVA is really based upon this kind of theoretical understanding of controls over our dependent variables.
All right. Very good. And we're, out, we're off and running. We're going to have a couple more videos on uh, the F test, for example, to, to see if uh, we have significant deviation from the null model. Um, and we're also going to have uh, a mini lesson on uh, the theory itself of you know, why it is that uh, the F test constructed as the way it is makes sense. So in these three lessons, we have kind of the essence of ANOVA boiled down to you, for you. Okay, see you then.